All right, good morning. Um, in our science of mind philosophy, we teach this idea that as within, so without. So the consciousness, the thinking that we embody, that we hold to be true for ourselves, most of the time is what actually is out picturing out here in our life. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about fear, and I believe that fear is a lack of faith or a, or a lack of trust in God. Uh, which essentially is the denial of the omnipresence of God, because we teach that God is everywhere equally present. Right? And so if, if, if we are in fear, then we must believe that there is some aspect or some area of our life where God is absent. You know, babies, they say, babies are afraid of loud noises and falling. Everything else, everything else they have to learn. So that means, other than loud noises and falling, every other fear we have, we have learned along the way. We've picked that up. And like I like to say, if you picked it up, you can put it down. So uh, fear, this self-made uh, energy of ours, uh, I believe must be completely destroyed. And the reason that's important is that that allows the Spirit of God to shine through us, to flow through us in a greater way. Right? So less fear equals more flow of God's good. But you know, fear, when we're holding on to fear, that like throws up a wall so the light cannot penetrate. The good of God cannot express more fully in our life. And I believe that for all of us, God's good is infinite. Right? So I think it's our attitude toward life that determines most of the experiences that, that we are met with. Right? If we expect misfortune, you know, we are certainly going to find it. You know, and if we expect things to be good, if we expect to meet loving people wherever we go, we will certainly, certainly find them. I'm always reminded of, of um, some years back, we took my parents on vacation. We went to this nice little bed and breakfast in Maine, and uh, we, I, my mother wanted to go look at antique stores, so I, of course, went off to look for dessert. And, um, and my father said, I'm going to sit on this little bench right here and wait. And I said, okay, chief, I'll be back in about a half an hour. And when I came back, uh, or I was uh, about a block down around the corner, uh, there were these two great big leather-chained biker dudes uh, with my dad. And I was a little concerned about this, you know, and so I started to pick up the pace and move quickly toward him. But as I was watching, they, they got on their motorcycles. They had these, you know, enormous Harleys where they were practically laying down. And they, they pulled out into the road, and they turned, and they waved to my dad. My dad waved to them, and they took off. And I come running, go, Dad, Dad, what's going on? He goes, what do you mean, what's going on? I said, those biker guys, I mean, what was going on? He says, nothing. And I said, well, well, how did you start talking to them? He says, they pulled up on their motorcycles. And I said, hey, what's it like riding those motorcycles? <laughs> now, you have to understand, my dad was about 90 years old at this time. And, uh, and I said, well, weren't you were afraid? And he said, afraid? He said, of what? He said, they're not going to hurt me. He says, you know, nice people are everywhere. And that was really my father's experience in life, that he really believed that nice people were everywhere and my father was one of those guys that everywhere he met, went, he met a friend, whether he had known them before or not, but he really believed that nice people were everywhere. And the funny little piece of this story was these, these, these two guys had been to um, 49 states on their motorcycles, and the night before, the night before, my sister lives in a little town in upstate New York of 400 people. They were in her town the night before. I wish my, when my father found out, he says, God, I wish I'd known you yesterday. He said, you could have had dinner at my daughter's house. <laughs> yeah. And they would have. They would have. My sister would have made a lovely lasagna or something for them, you know. But the, um, so where did I go with that? Uh, let me think. <laughs> nice people are everywhere. If you believe that, you will meet them, right? He, you know, so knowing the law of God or good, you know, uh, the truth student that we are, we expect good fortune. We expect good to happen. Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of our teachers, says, there is good for me and I ought to have it. Now that good that exists for you in the infinite realm was created for you by God. So if God created something for you, shouldn't you have it? Yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. Right? So the world seems or appears harsh because we fail to claim, I think we, we do not affirm the presence of God in our life all the time. You know, often we're so afraid of criticism, you know, you know so... Uh, so many of uh, our most beautiful, uplifted thoughts 
never really see the light of day because we're so concerned what people are going to think or what they're going to say or they're going to turn their back on us. But, you know, to the person who believes that God is the only presence and power, this is an interesting thing. There is no past. Now, I know all of us have a past that we kind of carry along with us. You know, some of us carry it in a dump truck. Some of us maybe just a little valise. But we all have a past, and I believe that we're all... Uh, we continue to be affected by it. But to the person who believes in God, or believes that God is the only power and the only present, what happened in the past, it's not here. It's not relevant. To believe in the power of the past, you know, for example, oh, I've made these mistakes, I've made these bad choices, I've done the wrong thing. We're disbelieving in God, because God is the eternal now. Where will we know God? Where will we experience God? In this very present moment, in the now. You know, there is no future. There's no past in God. Scripture says now is the day of salvation. And so the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Salvation from what, we wonder? Especially as students of science of mind, salvation, that's a very dicey word for us. I would say if there's anything to be saved from, it is from my own negative, fearful, limited thinking. My own conversation in my head that, oh, this is not going to work out. Oh, they're not going to like it. Oh, 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 oh. Salvation from my own limited, fearful, negative thinking. I think our greatest good, you know, whether it's right work or uh, a healthy body or an abundant bank account or whatever that is for us, we must feel, hear that word, we have to feel the reality of that. Ernest Holmes says, that feeling is intelligently directed creation. When you feel something, you are setting the creative forces of the universe into motion. Right? So this is why capturing the feeling, even before we experience the thing, capturing that feeling and holding it, believing it, is really, really important to the creative process. Because I believe we have to enter into that conviction that we are now the person, that we are now the experience that we desire to be or have. You know, the only, the only guilt, I think, and I'm not a big fan of guilt, the only guilt is, there is, is your belief in guilt, right? So it, 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 so it says in the scriptures that your, your, your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So, what we thought was such a big deal, eh, not so much really. We've sort of built a case or held something against ourselves, and you have to know the universe does not hold anything against us. You know, if you say to yourself, oh, I will never recover from this, my life will never be able to go on past this experience, that will be true for you. But see, this is the great news because what matters is this present moment. What do I choose to believe and what do I choose to embody? What do I choose to accept for myself in this present moment? You can live, you can plan, you can think, you can experience, only in the now. Only in the now. Now, you and I probably both know people who, even though we would say today is the important thing, they are living mostly in the past or in the future. You know, they're having a little day trip down memory lane, remembering this and that and this and that, and usually it's not very good. Or they're spinning out as they think about the future and all the things that are going to go wrong. Now, I've got to say, that is creative in the wrong direction, okay? Both of those things are creative in the wrong way. Um, if you were planning for disaster, you're creating it. If you were planning for great good, you were contributing to creating that. So when we realize that every form of lack and limitation is the result of wrong thinking, wrong believing, wrong feeling, and it's all of those things, then we start to know the truth that sets us free. Like, oh, my thinking, my believing, and my feeling has something to do with what I'm experiencing in my life right now. And so if I just let my thinking run off and my believing run off, and I feel things that I know are not good for me or they're not going to support my greater expression in life, but I do it anyway, hmm, that is not going to set me free. But when I understand that all of that in me, my thinking, my believing, my feeling, is what's contributing to my experience in life, when I know that, that's the truth that makes me more free. So think for a brief moment about something you may fear. 
you know, just check in with yourself and think about some little thing that you may fear. And ask yourself, do I believe that there is another power here that challenges God? Do I believe there's something that's opposed to God? See, we teach in our, in our church here, we teach that there's only one principle, one power, one presence, one life, one love. It's God, and God's everywhere. God is all there is, that's all there is, and that's it, basically, right? So the only evil there is is due to a lack of knowledge of the laws of life. You know, when we misuse the laws, that looks like evil. So, you know, if you put your hand on an open wire, I mean a wire that is not insulated, you're going to get a shock, right? But if the wire is insulated properly, we don't get a shock when we touch the wire. So the, the so-called evil or the shock was due to our ignorance. Yet we all know electricity is not evil. We all benefit. We're all blessed by it again and again and again every day. So this is just like the power, the activity, the creative force of God in us. You know, evil or fear is the misapplication or incomplete um, comprehension of the omnipresence of God or good. Good is everywhere. Like my dad said, good people are everywhere. Right? So where fear is, love cannot be. So error cannot exist, though, where there is spiritual understanding. The errors that we experience cannot exist where we have spiritual understanding. You know, the, I was thinking about this, <laughs> and I thought, you know, people who have a lot sometimes fear that they're going to lose it. People who don't have very much fear that they're never going to get it. Right? So the only wealth and the only security, it seems to me, are found in the consciousness of knowing that God within us is the source of all good in our life, whether it's health or wealth or loving relationships. If we're conscious of being, if we think of ourselves now as, I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am loved, nothing can stop us, right? But, but that has to become second nature, that kind of thinking to us, right? So most of what people fear, I think, is unreal. You know, most of what people worry about happening never happens. Right? So, uh, I think the cause of a lot of fear is um, other people liberally scatter seeds of fear, right? And I think um, one of the number ones of those is what will people think? What will people think? I know people that that must be printed on their gravestone because they li it seemed to be the law of life that they live by. So with regards to this, I want to share something. This has been around a long time. I know many of you know it. And it was uh, the woman who wrote this originally called it warning. But many people know it as when I am old. And so uh, the woman who wrote this, her name was Jenny Joseph. She passed on January 8th at 85 years old. And she says, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat that doesn't go and doesn't suit me. Mm -hmm. I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves huh? and satin sandals and say, we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. <laughs> I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. Yeah. You can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausage at a go, or only bread and pickle for a week, and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We will have friends to dinner and read the paper but maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I'm, I am old and start to wear purple. <laughs> See, I think that all the fear that we have is due to ignorance. We're believing something that is not spiritually true, something that is not accurate. When we know that every form of discord, whether it's sickness or lack, is due in part to our wrong thinking, our wrong believing, our wrong feeling, we will know the truth that sets us free. So what I think is important is that we want to imagine the thing that we desire, whether it's a healed body or a loving relationship 
or a mortgage that's paid off, we want to imagine that desire and then feel the reality of that state, right? And so what we have to do, I think, or, or maybe another way is to convince ourselves that God is the only presence in power, if, that, if, if that's more simple, right? So regardless of the cause of your fear, you have only yourself to heal. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I love that about the science of mind, you know? If I see somebody and I say, oh my gosh, they look sick to me, then the consciousness I have to pray for is mine so that I see a healthy person. And if I see somebody struggling, then again, the consciousness I have to pray for is mine, so that I know that the truth is that God meets all needs even right now. Right? So you have to convince yourself that you are now expressing life and love and truth and abundant good. I think we want to be radiating courage and confidence and power out into the universe, because that's how the universe responds back to us. So say, say, say you were weak, or sick, or helpless, and you turn the law of God away from you. Do you know what I mean? You can use the law against yourself, or you can use it for you. So the Bible again says, now is the day of salvation. We turn to God and claim for ourselves that which we long to be. We claim for ourselves our greater good. But we have to accept it. We have to believe it. Right? If you keep your eye on the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of earth, you will notice that your life becomes a more heavenly experience. I believe that is absolutely true. So the truth makes us free. The truth that we believe is expressed. So this is it. If you check in with yourself and say, all right, what is the truth that I'm believing right now? Because that's what's being expressed in my life. There's no fear where faith in God rules, right? So it's possible to rise high enough in consciousness in five or ten minutes to bring about a subjective connection, right? A subjective connection where we really have this deep conviction. See, Ernest Holmes said we have to have both a conscious and subjective agreement for there to be a demonstration. And so I think an important component of this is that when we capture the feeling, you know, so this is, look, we all did this as kids. Now, I'm not saying that science of mind is let's pretend. We don't play let's pretend. We play let's create. But when we were kids, we could all create. How many of you remember getting presents that say Christmas, but you were more enthralled with the box? <laughs> you know, right? We see kids do that all the time. Right? They get a bunch of presents, but, but the presents are all over here, and they're crawling around in the box, having a great time with the box and wrapping the ribbon around themselves and sticking the wrapping paper up their nose or whatever they're doing. You know, It's great, but see, we've got to capture that feeling. And it doesn't take long. It only takes five, ten minutes, and your subjective mind says, wow, this must be what he wants us to produce. This must be what we're supposed to set about creating. So. So in the Bible it says, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I believe that kingdom for us is anything that adds to our life in a good, positive, loving, constructive, healthy way and does not hurt anyone else. And Jesus tells us again that the kingdom of heaven is within you. So maybe, I was thinking about that, I thought maybe it's like being colorblind. You know, people who are colorblind just don't see certain colors, you know? Maybe we just can't see because of centuries of false belief or conditioning or, or whatever. But you know, feeling impressed on our subconscious mind. So ask yourself this right now. If I were completely healed in this area of my life, whatever it is, if I were healed in the area of relationship, if I were healed in finance, if I were healed with my business, if I were completely healed, how would that feel? All right? All right, so you get that feeling hold on to it, and then you want to allow it to grow and expand and become completely real for you and stay in that place for five to 10 minutes. Stay in that place for five to 10 minutes because feeling impressed on our subconscious mind is made manifest by this immutable law of spirit. Think you can or think you can't, Henry Ford said, you're right, let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That each and every one of us, we are the children of the Most High. That in the mind and in the heart of God, there are no stepchildren. We are all God's beloved. And so as we know this and affirm it for ourselves, we know it for everyone here. 
And I speak the word for each and every one of us that where we have feared, I claim that the love of God within us, within our very being, our mind, our heart, our body, is greater than all of that. And so I accept for each and every one of us now that we embrace a feeling of answered prayer, whatever our prayer is, whether it's a healing of our body or a healing in a relationship, whether it's to have enough money or a place to live, I accept that the universe absolutely supports what we feel consistently and intensely. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends and loved ones, and we say God is right where they are, surrounding them and filling them, supporting them, uplifting them. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world in which we live. So where it looks like there is an awful lot of trouble, to God, it looks really easy. Because with God, all things are possible. So I claim that perfect healing is taking place everywhere in the world that we live in. That all needs are met, that there is peace, there's harmony, there's understanding, there is love for all people. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today that we let go of something that does not serve us and we embrace a greater spiritual truth that reveals more of who we truly are. And so with a full heart, I say thank you, God. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say...